Well, the stunning announcement that the Saudi-backed Live Golf Tournament was merging with the PGA has raised many questions surrounding the politics at play. It's not the first time Saudi's public investment fund has poured money into international sport and business as the kingdom looks to diversify its economy beyond oil. Here to discuss more is Hussein Ibish, senior resident scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. Uh, Hussein, good to talk to you today. You know, we know the Saudis have been looking to place their bets beyond oil for many years now. The private investment fund, we're talking about $650 billion in assets under management with the goal of hitting $1 trillion in a few years. How That's does right. the announcement yesterday fit into the grander vision? Well, it fits in perfectly in two different ways. First of all, the Saudis are looking to diversify in every possible way. They know that, you know, they, they've been, they're tardy to come to the diversification sweepstakes. They have a, a big population. Most of the oil exporting countries in the Gulf are city states. They're small, but there are at least 30 million Saudi citizens. And, you know, there are poor people today in Saudi Arabia. So, you know, they're facing a bleak future if they don't create a post hydrocarbon economy. They decided a couple of years ago that they want tourism and entertainment to be the number two industry in the country. And this is a radical transformation for a country that didn't want tourism, didn't allow entertainment for decades. But they're really building up their uh, tremendous historical sites that are, you know, sort of the, the, some of the earliest civilizations known to man. Uh, these uh, beautiful natural resources that they're promoting and spreading into other entertainments like sports, like uh, racing and cultural festivals, concerts, things unthinkable in the past. Now, this PGA merger, it fits perfectly because uh, it, it's designed not only to diversify Saudi Arabia's uh, economic holdings, but also to help its image internationally. And that's also important to Saudi Arabia. How much do you think it really is helping their image internationally? And many are viewing this actually that the Saudis did win this, like you are saying that this deal makes a heck of a lot of sense for them, that they are in a better position at this point. So what does this tell us just about right. what those future moves from the Saudis, what that could potentially look like? Well, I mean, it as <laughs> Saudi Arabia put itself in a real hole um, the Saudi government put the country in a real hole through several actions, through the intervention in Yemen, which was mishandled, and a lot of there was a lot of um, death and destruction in Yemen. Well, much of it wasn't Saudi Arabia's fault, but the Yemeni rebels uh, don't have an international address, and the Saudis do. So they ended up taking the blame for the whole Yemen war, which really is a catastrophe. Then there was the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, the Saudi journalist in Istanbul, in the consulate in Istanbul, which was a ghastly atrocity, and uh, human rights abuses that uh, rightly get attention and um, condemnation. So there is the a negative public image of Saudi Arabia, and it, it gloms on to earlier things like the oil embargo in 1973, 9-11 that was largely carried out by dissident anti-government Saudis, but still Saudis. So, you know, there is this a lot of baggage in the West and especially in the United States. Mm -hmm. So I think there is this idea that as Saudi Arabia becomes associated more with things like movies and uh, golf and, uh, you know, Formula One racing and concerts and tourism and culture and art, that that uh, could ho offset the, a lot of the negative impression that people have of Saudi Saudi Arabia, that it, it is based yeah. in fact, but it's unfair because uh, it doesn't take into consideration um, the reforms that have been going on that really are dramatic and impressive. Uh, Hussein, you know, I, I'm thinking to back to when uh, we had MBS essentially sort of lay out this vision of diversification right. beyond oil. Vision 2030 was supposed to be about this pivot to big tech. Yes, they have placed significant investments, but they haven't necessarily got investments into the kingdom with companies yeah. wanting to establish themselves there. That's so right. does that does that mean or has that accelerated these types of investments, essentially buying That's influence really abroad? That's the crucial question for Saudi Arabia, because uh, on the one hand, they've been successful in diversifying their own portfolio. Right. And, and this, this is another example of that. And, and it's not a problem for them if they want to take their money and spend it on something. They can do that and, and they can make money that way. And that's that's good insofar as it goes. But what they want and this was on big display in the in the, in the large financial conference they had 
in Riyadh last year where, you know, all the titans of American finance basically showed up. The government didn't. The Biden administration didn't. But, you know, the financial community came. Um, but the Saudis were they were successful in 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 making their own investments, but they haven't got um, a, a steady stream of foreign direct investment into Saudi Arabia. One of the biggest things holding investors back, especially large institutional investors, is the lack of transparency and the lack of rule of law in Saudi Arabia. They're making baby steps to this, but investors want to know um, what kind of rules are going to protect their money. If they get into a dispute with a prominent Saudi or something connected to the Saudi government and they try to sue to recover, what chances are there, they want to know, that they'll be treated fairly in a Saudi court? Where is the transparency? Where is the independent judiciary that could rule in favor of a foreign investor as opposed to a very powerful Saudi or even the government itself? That's a real question. And the Saudis haven't gone far enough in creating mechanisms that reassure foreign investors that uh, they that their uh, investments are protected and yeah. that they have predictable rules that if they play by those rules that they will be treated fairly and that it's not like there's a big track mm -hmm. record of people being ripped off it's just it's that it, when you're talking about amounts of that size mm -hmm. people really do want to know that there is a fair system behind it. Hussein, to what extent are our global regulators likely to stand in the way of that vision they want to build out domestically? You look at what's happening here in the U.S., for example, there's already talk of potentially somebody like yeah. a group like CFIUS stepping in. May not happen in, in this case with Live and PGA because it is sports and the concern seems to be more about data collection, but uh, it, it does make regulators a little uneasy. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And and it's that's something the Saudis are going to have to deal with, without a doubt. Um, in some cases, the regulators are going to have uh, very valid concerns. And at that point, again, it's up to the Saudis to demonstrate that um, that those concerns are, are not valid and to to get the investments, whether they're investing or someone's investing into them or it's joint, um, as in this case, then, uh, you know, it really is something where they have to prove that, you know, to these regulators uh, and even some sometimes multinational or multilateral organizations that uh, they're trustworthy and that it's OK. And, they, you know, they will feel um, they will feel harassed and put upon by right. that. But in fact, that's what everybody has to go through. You've got to demonstrate trustworthiness. You've got to show your bona fides in these international markets. Otherwise, investors will hold back, regulators will make objections, and it won't work. So I think they yeah. know that. It's just um, a, a very heavy lift. And they're, they're transforming so rapidly that uh -huh. you can't do everything all at once. And that's another of their big problems, is they're trying yeah. to go incredibly far, incredibly fast. I don't think we've seen this kind of change mm -hmm. in any country since Japan in the Meiji era, in the late 19th century. That's that's the probably the best analog. Yep. to the pace of change in Saudi Arabia today. Well, we have certainly seen a lot of change um, over in Saudi Arabia as well. It'll yep. be interesting to see Amazing. how this all plays out here in the U.S. too. Hussein Abish, senior right. resident scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. Appreciate your time today.